memorize, but something which they uh, had in written form, uh, and it is on the basis of that also that uh, books were developed, which we spoke about, the books of uh, Rijal, or Kutub al-Rijal, or Asma al-Rijal, in which uh, these, all this biographical information was compiled. And on the basis of these uh, biographical works, then hadiths were analyzed and uh, the uh, various narrators were classified. <clears throat> uh, in looking at the conditions for the authentic hadith, we looked at five conditions and we mentioned that we had previously uh, looked at three of them in our early presentation of the material and uh, in this uh, presentation we looked at an additional two which will now come out in more detail that was the Ghair uh, Shad we said this was the fourth condition after looking at Ittisal al-Sanad which is the continuity of the chain of narrators and then we looked at uh, the dot or soundness of memory or of write writing and we looked at adala which was uh, the character of the narrators that they were known to be uh, reliable individuals practicing good practicing muslims etc so we said that fourth point was that they did not uh, contradict more authentic narrations of the same text or a similar text. And the last point, the fifth point, was la illa, that it, didn't it did not contain in it some hidden defects. And in this session, we will be looking at some of those uh, defects. Now, the hadiths, we said, which did not fulfill these five conditions were generally referred to as hadith da'if or the weak hadith and sometimes they were referred to as khabar mardud or the rejected narrations and these when we look in terms of the causes for the rejection of the hadith we'll find them divided into two main categories either a break in the chain, right? discontinuity of the chain, or there is a defect in the narrator himself, an internal defect in that narrator. And the breaks in the chain may be either obvious or they may be hidden. And when we talk about la illa, the illa, this hidden defect, this is, these are the categories of the hidden defects. And the other, which is defect in the narrator, it, will, it goes back either to his uh, adala, that is his integrity, or to his dot, his uh, memory or ability to narrate accurately. So if we look uh, then at the first category, which is the breaks in the chain. The obvious breaks are, oh, are the breaks which are a result of narrators not coming in contact with the person they are narrating from. Somebody is missing from the chain of narration. And this is determined by the biographical works, which identify the errors in which they live and they will also identify the people from whom they studied and those from whom they were authentically reported to have narrated. And these books uh, have that kind of information so uh, one may identify where, where they were, who they studied from and if we find a narration which indicates that they're in a location where they didn't live or they weren't known to have gone, or that they were narrating from somebody who they were not known to have met, then this is an indication of a clear break. 
they lived in an era other than the one in which that person they were narrating from lived. They died before they were born, for example, or they were only two or three years old when the individual died. So to be narrating hadith from him is just obviously incorrect. There's somebody missing in that chain. And the obvious breaks have been divided into four basic uh, groups. The first being mu'allaq, or hanging. Mu'allaq meaning hanging. Allaqa, which is your uh, hanger, it comes in alaq, you know, right? This, uh, you're referring to the clinging thing, you're referring to the fetus clinging in the womb, you know? Uh, this is mentioned, uh, this is the same root, comes from the same root. So mu'allaq, uh, the first category of the obvious breaks, what it refers to is a hadith in which only the tail end of the, uh, of the narration exists. Right? The, the normal pattern of a hadith will have, uh, first and foremost, it will have it will start from the person who narrated to the compiler, say Bukhari. Whenever you see the hadith, uh, the person, the next person which will say, he will say, Haddathana somebody or the other, right? That person is the last person to, from whom Al-Bukhari got his hadith. Then he will mention the person from whom he got it and from whom he got it till it goes to the Sahabi, then it goes to Rasulullah Sallallahu so when we say the last end of the chain is missing, we mean everybody after the Sahabi. So just the Sahabi's name alone is mentioned. This is the typical way that we find hadith today. We'll just see Ibn Abbas said so and so, Ibn Omar said so and so, Abu Huraira said so and so. This format of hadith uh, is referred to as mu'allaq. I mean, in the in the days of the uh, the early days of the hadith compilations that was considered to be a weak hadith, an inauthentic hadith, the way in which we narrate it today. It had to have the complete chain of narration for it to be classified as continuous uh, chain. Now, these uh, hadiths in which we have the last part of the chain missing, as I said, is generally considered to be a weak hadith. However, when we find such hadiths in collections like Bukhari and Muslim, they are not looked at in the same light as when we find them in the, uh, in the lesser connections. In Bukhari and Muslim, for example, there's a hadith in Sahih Bukhari uh, in which uh, Abu Musa said that the Prophet Sallallahu covered his thigh when Uthman entered. Right? He was mentioning that he was sitting and part of his thigh was exposed. You know, Abu Bakr came in and he sat with him and talked with him. Omar came, sat and talked with him. And then Uthman came in and he adjusted his clothing and covered his thigh. Actually, the narration mentions thigh, but there are some other narrations which mentions uh, shin, really. And that is the more authentic uh, narration. And that it is really, it was really shin and not thigh. And really, because on the basis of this, you do find some scholars hold that you know, the thigh or parts of the thigh is not considered to be aura. But actually, as I said, when one gathers all of the narrations concerning this particular incident, the greater uh, likelihood of what was actually narrated was that it was the shin of the Prophet Muhammad and not his thigh. Hmm? Anyway, the point is that this narration is mentioned uh, with... Uh, where Bukhari quotes directly from Abu Musa without mentioning the rest of the chain. So on the basis of that, it was classified as da'if. But, and that's why you will hear some people say, and some people get shocked when they hear this, that there are da'if hadith or weak hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. That these hadith, which are considered to be weak hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, are in this category, the category of the mu'allaq, Hadith. Same thing in Sahih Muslim. In fact, there are more such hadiths in Sahih Bukhari than there are in Sahih Muslim. This is why some scholars did consider Sahih Muslim to be more accurate or more authentic than Sahih Bukhari. Though the general 
generality of scholars of hadith considered Sahih Bukhari to be uh, more accurate because of the, uh, the more stringent criteria which Imam Bukhari used for collecting his hadith. Anyway, the point is that these various hadiths which are found in the Mu'allaq uh, form in Bukhari and Muslim, other scholars have, after the time of Bukhari and Muslim, tracked down these hadiths and identified them in connected form, mutasil forms, in other books of hadith. The vast majority of them are in connected forms in other books of hadith. So, though they are technically speaking daif, the vast majority of them are in fact authentic, Hassan or even Sahih. What was happening here was that both Bukhari and Muslim would use uh, certain hadiths as headings for chapters or sections. And since it was being used as a heading, they didn't bother to bring the whole chain. <laughs> Wherever you find such hadiths, they are not being used as the primary evidence. They are only used as like a heading, a notation. Whereas the real evidence will be in the chapter itself, right, which are uh, connected hadiths. Among those hadiths, for example, is the one uh, also found in, in Bukhari. Uh, there will be among my nation people who will make lawful fornication, silk, intoxicants, and musical instruments. Right? And, you know, some people in, in justifying or trying to justify music, musical instruments, you know, argue that this hadith was da'if in Sahih al-Bukhari, because it was in the mu'allaq form. However, it is found muttasal or connected in the collections of Al-Bayhaqi, Al-Tabarani, and Ibn Asakir. And also in the Sunan of Abi Dawood, but from another narrator, instead of being from Abu Amr, Amir, sorry, it is from Abdurrahman Ibn Yazid. So uh, it is in fact an authentic hadith, though in its form, as it exists in Bukhari, it falls under the heading of Mu'allaq hadiths, which are not in fact authentic. Right? So it is not authentic based on its form, but it is in fact authentic based on its contact, its content and uh, supportive evidence, right? where it is found in a connected form in other books of hadith. Okay? That is the wallah. So we understand from this why it may be said that there are weak hadiths in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, which we consider to be the most, the two most authentic books after the Quran. The two most authentic books in Islam after the Quran are Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. So the fact that there are weak hadiths in form in those books don't change the status of the books of being the two most authentic books after the Quran. The second category is that of Mursal. And Mursal hadith may be uh, translated as a generalized hadith. And this is uh, referring to the fact that the a narrator, you know, has been deleted from the chain. And the most common form in which it comes is the deletion of the Sahabi himself, meaning that a Tabi'i, a student of the Sahaba, quotes the Prophet Muhammad directly. And it is known he didn't meet the Prophet Muhammad so we have a hadith in which a link in the chain, the final link in the chain, is missing. An example of that can be found in Sahih Muslim, in the chapter on 
business transactions where he has Muhammad ibn Rafi' told me that Hujain told them that Al-Layth reported from Aqil, from Ibn Shihab, from Sa'id ibn al-Musayyab that Allah's Messenger forbade Al-Muzabana. Now, Sa'id ibn al-Musayyab was a tabi'i, a student of the Sahaba who did not meet the Prophet So such a narration would be considered weak because, uh, and, and, and the heading given to it is Mursal because of the fact that the Sahabi has been deleted. So really when they use the term Mursal, they mean Mursal as Sahabi. Right? They make a distinction between this and other uh, gaps in the chain. Because one could say, well why later on down this is not also considered to be Mursal? Why do they refer to Mursal only at that level. Why did they make a stress, a particular point here? Because this represents a part of that first three generations, right? About which Prophet spoke. The best of generations, as he said, was my generation, Sahaba. Then those who come after them. Then those who come after them. So the gaps at this point, at the end of the chain, in the best of generations, these gaps are given a special consideration, not given to gaps later on in the chain because of the Prophet's witness to the superiority of those three generations. Right? Meaning that the Sahaba, for example, who narrated hadith, all of the Sahaba are generally classified as adul, and they are all trustworthy. Right? Those who narrated hadith from among the Sahaba they are all classified as trustworthy. It's automatic. So, those who narrated from the Sahaba, these individuals who had uh, a high reputation, their dropping a Sahabi's name was considered differently from later scholars dropping other intermediaries from the chain. However, such a hadith in general is still considered to be a weak hadith. But if it is the uh, mursal or the dropping of the final sahaba by certain scholars, people like uh, Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, it is well known, for example, that he never narrated from other than the sahaba. So it is assumed that if he dropped a person, it was a Sahabi who he dropped. Others who narrated and who were known to narrate from other than the Sahaba because a Tabi'i may have studied under another Tabi'i. So sometimes he may narrate from a Tabi'i, that is a student of the Sahaba, and sometimes he may narrate from a Sahabi. Right? So those who are not known in that way to have only narrated from Sahaba, such there if they dropped somebody, then their hadith would be considered daif, which could be elevated if there were supporting narrations found, right? Because they are from that generation of trust, you know, and reliability. So if supporting narrations came, such a hadith, morsel hadith, could be elevated to the level of uh, sahih or hasan li ghairi. And if the person um, dropped, who dropped the final narrator was a Sahabi himself, right? if the person who dropped it was a Sahabi himself, because you had cases where there were young Sahaba, people like Abdullah ibn Abbas, you know, Abdullah ibn Umar, and others, Anas ibn Malik, these were all quite young Sahaba. And they used to gather uh, hadiths from other Sahaba who had been with the Prophet ﷺ from the early days. So they sometimes narrated directly from the Prophet ﷺ and sometimes they narrated from other Sahaba. So if they narrated a, an incident, for example, how would you know? 
we said he's a Sahabi. How do we know that he is not in fact narrating directly from the Prophet Muhammad Well, if we know, for example, say Anas ibn Malik, he was gifted by his mother to Prophet Muhammad uh, Um Sulaim, shortly after the Hijrah. You know, she took him, he was about six years old, and she gave him to Prophet Muhammad as his personal servant. And he would be with him, just grew up in his household, he, you know, wherever the Prophet ﷺ went, he was there with him. You know, then Har- narrations mentioned when he would even go to the bathroom, he would bring the water for him, whatever. There was Anas, right, growing up with the Prophet ﷺ. So, if Anas narrates an incident which took place in Mecca, he was only uh, brought in contact with the Prophet ﷺ in Medina, he obviously must be narrating it from another Sahabi because he wasn't there to witness it. If he's quoting Prophet Muhammad that's a different thing. Because of course the Prophet could have told him things, right? But if he's narrating an incident, it will be assumed that he is narrating it from another Sahabi. So these are the ways and means by which the Sahaba, and Abu Huraira for example, he also, because he only joined uh, the Prophet company for three years towards the end of his life. So if he was narrating incidents which took place in the early days in Medina, or in Mecca, obviously he got that information from other Sahaba. But if we find a case like this, it is assumed, since all of the Sahaba or are adul or uh, have a high level of integrity, we trust whatever they narrate, then for a Sahabi to delete the mention of another Sahabi from whom he's narrating doesn't affect that hadith. So Mursal from the Sahaba, where a Sahabi is the one who drops another Sahabi, that doesn't make that hadith classified as da'if. It's known it will not be classified as da'if. Right? Because it was inconceivable, or we could say it was not the practice of the Sahaba to gain hadith from the tabi'in because to say to go down to come back up again that he got it actually from a tabi'in who got it from a sahabi who you know this was not their route whenever they narrated they narrated from other sahaba okay <clears throat> the third category right so basically what we're saying is that the mursal which is questionable is the mursal which comes from a tabi'in a tabi'i dropping the mention of a sahabi. It is considered weak if that tabi'i was known to narrate from other tabi'is. But if, as in the case of, of Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, he was known only to narrate from sahaba, then his narrations were still accepted. Because if a tabi'i said, for example, I heard from one of the Sahaba that so and so and so and so it, without mentioning the name of the Sahabi this is still considered to be an authentic narration because all of the Sahaba were accepted as being reliable witnesses so therefore whether you mention the name of the Sahabi or you just mention I heard from a Sahabi as a Tabi here of course the reliable Tabi is then that was still an accepted mode of narration, accepted as authentic. So therefore, a tabiri who was known only to narrate from Sahaba, and he narrates directly from Rasulullah it is assumed that he was narrating from a Sahabi and dropped the name. And one may ask, why would they do that? Right? Why would they do that? The point is that in the course of teaching, right, scholars, especially that, that early generation, I mean, they're relaying information from Rasulullah. Sometimes they're teaching the generation afterwards. Sometimes they will mention specifically, well, I heard it from such and such a Sahabi and so on, so on, so on. Or somebody asks, you know, well, what do you do in this case? He said, well, the Prophet said so on, so on, so on, so on, so on. Not that he's deliberately dropping out who he heard it from, who said that the Prophet said, but just for responding to a particular question. He responds that the Prophet said, or the Prophet did, when in fact he didn't see or hear it from the Prophet So it was not a deliberate 
attempt uh, to falsify information, but in the course of teaching, this kind of lap these kind of lapses would take place for speed of conveyance of information. <clears throat> now, the third type of obvious breaks is called munqatir. Munqatir from qata, which means to cut or to break. Irsal from arsala which means to send. Mursal comes from the verb arsala, which means to send. Rasul comes from the same root. Risala comes from the same root. Something which is sent. The Rasul, someone who was sent. Huh? So, Munqatir. This is the next uh, category, where we have a break in the chain, where one or more of the narrators have been deleted at random in the middle of the chain. Right? It may be one, maybe more. Munqatir, broken. It's considered to be broken. We don't call it mursal. If it's in the middle of the chain and uh, towards the end of the chain. For example, we have a narration uh, of Abdul Razak from a Thawri, from Abu Ishaq, from Zayd ibn Yusha, from the Prophet Sallallahu that he said, it would be good if you made Abu Bakr your leader, for he is strong and trustworthy. Well, it is known that the narrator, Shuraik, who narrated from Abdul Razak, had deleted from the middle of the chain between a Thawri and Abu Ishaq because a Thawri did not hear any narrations from Abu Ishaq directly, but used to hear them through Shuraik, who studied under Abu Ishaq. So these are among the signs when you go back to who they studied from, who they studied with, this is what's going to reveal you know, breaks in the chain. Now the fourth example, fourth example is called Mu'adal, Mu'adal, and these are just names for different types of break, right? Mu'adal, in the case of Mu'adal, you have two narrators dropped at any point in the chain. They call that Mu'adal, but it's really just another version of Munqatir, right? But the scholars of Hadith gave it where there were two, they gave it another title as Mu'adal. Now, if uh, two or more narrators are, are dropped from the uh, beginning of the chain, then this is referred to as Mu'allaq. So really, Mu'allaq is a form of Mu'adal. Two or more narrators dropped right, from the chain is the general category. But if it's from the beginning of the chain, then it's considered to be Mu'allaq, right? If it's in the middle of the chain, then it keeps just the name Mu'allaq. And uh, we can find in Al-Hakim, for example, in his book called Ma'rifati Ulum Al-Hadith, that Qa'rabi reported from Malik that a report reached him from Abu Huraira that is that the Prophet Sallallahu had said, the slave should be given food and clothing according to normal standards and not burdened with work beyond his ability. Now this hadith is classified as mu'adal because Malik uh, has deleted here two narrators between himself and Abu Huraira. Malik was not uh, a tabir, he's studying under the uh, sahaba, but a tabi or tabi. So that uh, covers our basic uh, grouping group of breaks in the chain. If the, if the break is at the beginning of the chain, that is going to the sahabi, that is called in general uh, mursal. If it is the latter part of the chair chain, leaving only the last narrator, the Sahabi, that's what we call Mu'allaq. Okay. 
if it is uh, a break in the middle of the chain, one person missing at random throughout the chain or in any place in the chain, that's what we call munqatir. And if it was two or more people missing in the middle of the chain, we call it mu'adal. The other uh, type of break is the hidden break. Right? And this is where we come into the issue of the fifth condition for siha or the fifth condition for authenticity that it does not contain any hidden defects among them the hidden breaks the first category of the hidden breaks is called mudallas uh, mudallas coming from dallasa which means to fake right? tadlis means faking right? or mudallas we may call counterfeit now dallasa which means basically it means to hide something right especially when people are selling things to hide it uh, the defects of a product from the buyer they call this dallasa this form of uh, defect may be in either the chain itself, they call it Tadlisa Senad, or it may be in the case of the person who is narrating, they call it Tadlis Ashuyukh. Now Tadlisa Senad has two basic forms. The first is where a narrator narrates something which he did not hear from someone who he studied under in an ambiguous fashion. He narrates something he didn't hear from somebody who he actually studied under. And he uses an ambiguous fashion to narrate it. Meaning, he uses among the terms an, and so A narrator narrates something which he didn't hear from someone who he studied under right, in an ambiguous fashion. Remember we talked about people finding books? right? So somebody may have studied under this teacher and he found a set of books of the teacher containing information which he didn't hear from the teacher. But he narrates it in an ambiguous way as if he heard it from the teacher. This is called Tadlis as Senad. In the actual chain of narration, there is uh, uh, we could say some uh, falsification. There's some falsification has taken place in the Senad itself. And how are these things were known was that where a, a, a narrator narrates, people would sometimes question them if they had doubts. So people would ask for the detail to clarify. Did you actually hear this? As in the case of Ali ibn Khashram, who said that Ibn Uyayna related it to us from Az-Zuhri. But when he was asked, did you actually hear it from Az-Zuhri, he replied, Abdul Razak informed me from Muammar from Az Zuhri. Right? The way in which he was first narrating it, he mentioned it as if Az Zuhri actually said it. But when he was pinned down, did you actually hear it from Az Zuhri? Then he clarified, no, actually, I heard it from uh, these other two people, Abdul Razak and Muammar, who actually heard it from Az Zuhri. And again, this was not necessarily a deliberate attempt to uh, falsify the chain, but in haste of narration, people might do this. Because the people who he dropped, Abdul Razak and Muammar, were not people who were necessarily weak narrators. So by saying, I heard it from Abdul Razak, he was actually strengthening the narration that he was giving. Now, the other way in which this form of tadlis in the Senate or the Isnad can take place 
is where a Rawi or a narrator narrates from his teacher deleting from the chain a weak narrator between two strong narrators who met each other. Right? He is narrating in a chain. He mentions the name of two strong narrators who met each other. Right? So a person hearing that would assume this is a continuous chain and an authentic chain. However, between these two strong narrators, there was in fact a weak narrator who he doesn't mention. Right? This is another form of Ted Lee's Ascendant. And uh, uh, this of course is much a much more dangerous form because it does give the impression that uh, the chain is actually in fact authentic and this requires you know really deep research to catch it this is why when we talked about the hadith to be sahih it has to be free of hidden defects some of these hidden defects are more obvious others of them are much more hidden and then requires some serious research Now, the other form of Tadlis is called Tadlis Ashuyu. And this is, a case, this is a case where a narrator narrates a hadith from his teacher, which he heard from him, but he uses a nickname of that teacher, which was not the name that he was well known by. In doing so, he may have mentioned a name which is of another teacher, which is also known, another teacher was known by it. A person looking at that chain of narration may think that this chain is a strong chain because the name that he has used is that of somebody who has been classified as the highly reliable narrators. But in the biographical works, it indicates that this individual, in fact, did not sit with that strong narrator, but the one we sat with was with this other narrator who was weak and who was also known by this nickname, which they call Kunya, which happened to be similar to that other narrator's name. So again, when we're analyzing a chain of narrators, right, we want to know, is this an authentic chain or not? If one merely lists the narrators, goes to the books to confirm that the people who are narrating are all reliable people, you may conclude that that chain of narration is authentic from the basis of it. However, if you check in terms of the biographical information about who they narrated from, then you may discover weaknesses in the chain which would not have been obvious had you only judged according to their level of uh, authenticity or level of accuracy. Uh, is this confusing enough for you? <laughs> anyway, the um, ways by which they are able to identify the studies. One, either by this, the scholar or student himself admitting when he was directly questioned, so it came to be known, or by the statement of his contemporaries, those who studied along with him. And we have a scholar like Al Khatib al Baghdadi. He put together a book called At-Tibyan Li Asma Al Mudallisin. At-Tibyan Li Asma Al Mudallisin. He just, his study, he just made a specialized research where he went through and just collected up all of the people who biographical information, their admission, etc., uh, uh, put them in the category of. 
and he has such a book. So now modern researchers in going through to analyze will after analyzing or identifying the people in the chain this is a, a good reference to check to make sure none of these people though they in and of themselves are authentic they may have been known for at least this would be useful to make that clarification and a well-known modellist right, whose work is one of the most popular works is Ibn Ishaq Ibn Ishaq who wrote or compiled what is known to be the most classical Sirah book on Sirah right, translated into English by Guliam called the life of Muhammad so it's a big thick book with all of the narrations there you hear all the see all the chains and everything in it it's a well-known book it's been uh, condensed etc and it's the most popular book on the life of Prophet but Ibn Ishaq right and it's also known as Sirah Ibn Hisham because Ibn Hisham is the one who condensed it from the work of Ibn Ishaq now Ibn Ishaq was known to be a modellist he was known to be a modernist. And this is why, for example, the vast majority of material on the biography of the Prophet Muhammad that is available in the market, the vast majority of the material contains a lot of inaccurate information. A lot of inaccurate information. And it wasn't until very recent that scholars actually focused on the Sira to identify the authentic narrations of the Sira. And so you now have a couple of books on the market which are called Sahih Sira Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in which the scholars have used the methodology of the muhaddithin, the scholars of hadith to uh, present the life of Prophet Muhammad in a, an accurate format <clears throat> so common some of the stories that you know people are quite familiar with about the time when the Prophet was uh, being born that a light shone from the uh, parts of uh, his mother Amina and it lit up the, um, the horizons you know and that uh, uh, the temples you know and the Zoroastrian the fire in the temples of the Zoroastrians went out and that the um, you know it horizons you know and that uh, uh, the temples you know and the Zoroastrian the fire in the temples of the Zoroastrians went out and that the um, you know in the temples of the Christians and that they, they shook and oh there's a whole bunch of information this is all fable this is all fable though it is commonly narrated and we you know we pass it on to our children and it's in the books that we're reading but in fact these are not authentic tales and even that you know the angel came to his mother Amina prior to the birth and all this the vast majority of that information is not authentic at all <clears throat> the other uh, category after we looked at the model list the at least or counterfeiting the next uh, category is called Mursal Khafi. We looked at Mursal over this side, the obvious breaks. These are obvious. This is the Mursal where it is obvious that Irsal has taken place. Well, the Mursal Khafi is a very, very fine distinction between what we call the Tadlisa Senad and this Mursal Khafi. It's very fine. The difference is basically, if we say the Muslim Khafi is that someone narrates something 
he did not hear from someone whom he met or who was his contemporary using a terminology implying that he heard from him this sounds just like Tadlis the Senate the difference is in Tadlis the Senate the person who is doing that is narrating from somebody who he studied under in the case of Mursal al khafi he is not narrating from somebody who he studied on. This is the difference between the two. Now, how do we know or how can we identify this? One, the statement of one of the scholars that such and such a narrator never met the narrator from whom he is narrating or that he never heard anything from him. His contemporaries expose him. That's one of the ways of knowing. The second is that the narrator informs on himself. He admits he didn't hear uh, anything directly from the person he's narrating. And there are records of it. Or if the hadith itself comes along a chain in which people are added between the narrator and the one from whom he is narrating. The hadith comes along a chain in which people are added between the narrator and the one from whom he is narrating. <clears throat> By analyzing the chain, this person is a contemporary of somebody else. He adds people in between himself and that person who shouldn't be there. The third and last category of the hidden breaks is that of the Mu'annan Hadith and the Mu'annan Hadith. I've only put the Mu'annan here. That is the Hadith in which An is used. The person says, you know, he heard using An from so and so, An so and so, An so and so, you see it throughout the chain. Right? And as we mentioned before, remember we talked about the terminology that was used, the technical terminology used by the narrators of hadith. That the stronger forms was to say, Haddathana, right? He told us. Akhbarana, he informed us. Amba'ana, he informed us. Another version, but we said it meant really when he received it, the books in his hands. Huh? And Samirtu, I heard. These were the strong terminologies. But whereas when the person says, An, and is being used from it implies that he got it but it doesn't clarify what root he got it from right? so a hadith which has an throughout it will fall into the category of da'if if the person who is using the term an was known to be a mudallis this is the point if the person was a known solid narrator and he uses the an, then it is uh, accepted. Right? As long as the people who he uses the term an from were people who lived in his say in his his own. Uh, time period. They were his contemporaries. So it is, the chances of him actually meeting them were extremely high, very strong. There is contemporaries. He uses this terminology. But when he uses it uh, from somebody who is not his contemporary, then that will cause the hadith to be classified as weak. Unless he himself is of a high level of reliability. Right? He's a tabi'i. And he says, An is a hobby. They will accept it. No problem. But if he's later on down the chain, he is of the lower levels, but still acceptable. Makbul, saduq, these terminologies are used for him. And he uses the term An from somebody of a level above him, then they will consider it to be weak. And they won't accept it. Now, we 
we come over uh, the Mu'annan, the Mu'annan, you know, is uh, using the the conjunction Anna that, right? That it is considered the same as An, following the same conditions, same principles governing it. That's just another version. If we now go over to defects in the narrator himself, we said that they were either related to adala or trustworthiness, integrity, or they were related to dot or uh, reliability in terms of uh, surety of the material that they were narrating. Under the heading of adala, If a narrator was labeled either a liar, kathab, or he was accused of lying, muttaham bil kathib, or uttuhima bil kathib, or he was known to be immoral, drank alcohol, he committed any of the major sins, or he was known to be an innovator, is introduced principles into the religion which are not a part of it, or he is himself an obscure individual, not known. All of these defects, obscure, the term used for it really is majhul, all of these defects will automatically cause the hadith to be classified as life. Now, if the reason that uh, the individual due to Adala is classified as, as weak is due to the fact that he is majhul, he is unknown, obscure individual, then this uh, narration, this narration may be, may be reclassified as Hassan Lighayri, though it is initially Daif, if there are supporting narrations through other channels which confirm the same statement. Because he was just Majhul, unknown. And he still remains a Majhul individual, who whenever he is found in a chain, that Hadith will be automatically classified as Daif. If supportive narrations come, it is elevated. If no supportive narrations come, it is left as life. Similarly, if the individual is a narrator, we say, uh, an innovator, we said, if what he is narrating is in the area of his innovation, so like for example, he was an innovator, he's among those who said that we are what they call majboor, that we have no choice. We, are, we have no free will. There were those who made this claim. Right? And people, a number of people accepted this because there are narrations, if you take them by themselves, they may indicate this. For example, the hadith in Sahih Muslim, in which Prophet ﷺ said that a person will do the deeds of the people of paradise throughout his life and Shortly before he dies and would go to paradise, the destiny would catch him and he would start to do the deeds of the people of hell, die doing those deeds and be cast into hell because of it. And vice versa. A person will do the deeds of the people of hell throughout his life until he reaches a bow's length away from hell just before he's going to die. The destiny catches him, he starts to do the deeds of the people of paradise, he dies doing those deeds, and he's put in paradise for it. What does this imply? It implies really we have no control. We are, uh, we are without free will. Right? We're like robots, puppets. This implication is there. But if we take the many other hadiths, which address issues of choice and Allah's attribute of being just. 
that he is not going to punish a person if they are not held accountable, right? If they have done a mistake for which they're not held accountable, they're not punished for it. So when we put all of that together, then we realize that we must have a choice here. The whole issue of judgment only makes sense if we have a choice. If we have no choice, then what is the point of the judgment? Allah will destine for us to do wrong and then punish us for doing wrong. Is that fair? Okay. So anyway, the point is that some people got caught up in this idea that we have no choice. Right? It's blind destiny, as they say. And you will hear people saying that today inadvertently. When they will say, for example, you know, marriage is just nasib. Something happens in their mind, you say, nasibi, it's just, you know, my destiny. But in other words, they don't talk about it. The person that you were going to marry was already written. And you have no choice but to marry that person. And it's already written. To a certain degree, there is truth to it, in that everything which will take place was written. But what is written is the choices that you're going to make. Not that Allah put in the book, you are going to marry this person and is going to force you to marry this person. What's the difference? What's the difference? <laughs> the difference is that one indicates the knowledge, the pre-knowledge of Allah of everything, and your free will is intact. And the other one indicates that there is no free will and we are just puppets doing what Allah is forcing us to do and he will then judge us and punish us for things we had no choice about doing. This is the difference. Practically speaking, we can say in both cases it's written and what is written happens. But when you get into the, the fine difference, there is a distinction here because in one case we make Allah unjust of course their argument is that justice is only applicable to the creation since everything is Allah's he can do with it as he pleases who can say he is unjust or is good we don't have the right to say that <laughs> this is their argument of course they have a set of arguments that come along with it but the point is that this was considered to be an innovation the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, did not understand destiny in this way. They recognized we had a choice, you know, and they recognized destiny at the same time. And as Omar anhu, on one occasion when argued, why are you going to cut my hand off when it is by Allah's destiny that I stole? Allah destined that I would steal, and so I stole, and I stole. So now you're going to cut my hand off. So Omar radiallahu stopped for a second, and then he replied to him, "Yes, it is by Allah's destiny that you stole, and it is by Allah's destiny that I'll cut your hand off." <laughs> okay. Yes, it is written. You made the choice to steal, and it is written that I applied Allah's law on you. To cut your hand off because otherwise it doesn't make sense that Allah would have the law to cut off the hand of the thief if the thief didn't have any choice in stealing. So a person who was known to follow this line of reasoning where they're looking at the whole affair as being not having any free will it's just blind destiny it's another way they call it blind destiny such a person is classified as an innovator. Right? And such a person, if he or she is narrating something about Qadr, then their narrations are not accepted. But if they are narrating about something not related to Qadr at all, then their narrations will be accepted. If they have the other conditions of uh, authenticity, that they were not known to be immoral, that they uh, had good memories or they narrated from their books or whatever, 
then their narrations are accepted. So this principle of not accepting what they narrate in the area of the, the, in the area in which they innovated, this is just a, uh, you could say a precaution that the scholars of hadith took. Even though what they are narrating may be in fact be true, but just the fact that they deviated in this manner, you know, and there is a doubt here that maybe they are presenting something to support their deviation, they're not telling it quite like it was, then just because that doubt was there, they would not accept their narration. So those who narrated, so for example, this narrator may have narrated something on Qadr, and the uh, hadith is classified as Da'if, but then we find another chain in which that same information has been transmitted by people who are not known to be innovators, then that hadith, which was initially classified as da'if, becomes elevated to the level of hasan li possibly to hasan, depending on the strength of the chain, the rest of the chain, even up to sahih. It could go actually from da'if all the way up to sahih. And it has that possibility. Okay? However, if the person was known to be a liar, right? it's another case, this guy, person was a known liar, or he was accused of lying, then his narration is given a special title. It's under the heading of Da'if, but it's given another title, which is called Mawdur. Fabricated. Classified as fabricated. Under yeah, well it's under uh, it's under the general heading of daif, right? Because all these are weak hadith. These are the factors for the adala here. It is a weakness, a defect in adala. I don't look at adala as being the factor for weakness. It is the weakness in the adala which then makes the hadith classified da'if. Now, if it is due to the fact that the individual was a liar, then that individual's narration is reclassified as an, you know, under the general heading of da'if. It is reclassified as mawdur. Now, once a hadith is classified as mawdur, fabricated, then it can never be elevated. Even if another chain comes along, which is in fact carrying the same information, that hadith remains mawdur and cannot be used. Okay? This is the special class of da'if, which cannot be uh, elevated, cannot be uh, raised okay? in status because of the seriousness of that weakness. And there are a number of such hadiths which people quote regularly. Among them is the hadith, Utlub al ilm fisseen. Seek knowledge even unto China. This is a mawdur hadith, fabricated. Seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave, fabricated. Even though the idea and the concept may be very good, but it is a fabricated hadith. It should not be ascribed to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi There is another one, a popular one, which is uh, people will quote to, that um, supporting one's country or one's, uh, uh, how do they put it now? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Love of one's country is from faith. Hubbul watani min al iman. Loving one's country is from faith. This is fabricated. In fact, it promotes nationalism, which Islam is strongly opposed to. Right? <clears throat> Now, the 
the other the other uh, area of weakness which relates now to dot this can this can take place in about in five different ways one if the person made an excessive amount of errors in their narrations meaning they narrated the same information a number of different times in a number of different ways the wording is changing he's making errors in his narration of the material and how do we know that we know that from the many narrations of people who narrated from him comparing what they narrated from him it becomes evident that this person is changing his wording every so often meaning he's making a lot of mistakes secondly he has a weak memory he forgets elements from the hadith etc he has a weak memory thirdly he is negligent he pardon he is negligent meaning that he drops for example you know people in the chain sometimes he narrates a chain completely sometimes incompletely he is negligent this tagliz you know he's known as a mudallis in a lot of his uh, narrations right this is a sign of negligence where he's not known to really be a corrupt individual but it's just out of carelessness that he has ended up doing this also he's known for misinterpretations he narrates information but he misinterprets them he gives explanations because those who are collecting narrations from their teachers they also listen to their interpretations there would be words in the hadith which they would clarify the implement the, the, the implications of the hadith which they would give that due to their uh, lack of knowledge they made misinterpretations of the hadith such a person who is known to have made misinterpretations is then classified as weak because of his doubt you know his uh, his accuracy is questionable and the last issue is that he was known to contradict reliable reporters meaning that often times the narrations which he conveyed they were shot right and what the person is labeled with that he is known in a number of his narrations to contradict stronger narrators then he is then classified as a weak narrator with regards to his accuracy or not now what is the position on the hadith daif how can we utilize this hadith the general position is that a hadith daif is an inaccurate narration or report it's inaccurate meaning that we cannot accurately attribute it to the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam meaning as a result that it cannot be used to establish some point of islamic law any point of islamic law which is based on a weak narration then becomes an invalid point for example in the hanafi madhab the position for a man in prayer is to place his right hand over his left hand below his navel there is a narration which is attributed back to ali radhiyallahu anhu on which this practice is based however in the chain of narration is an individual by the name of abdul rahman who is in fact known to be weak in fact he was known to be a liar so that narration is not an authentic narration and that point of practice that is placing the hand right hand on the left hand below the navel is not authentic is not an established practice unless one can bring some other evidence to support this practice and in fact in the hanafi school there is, there is no other authentic evidence all of the hadiths which are used with regard to it are 
week. And in fact, the only authentic narration with regard to placing of the hand is to place the right on the left on the chest, which was narrated by Fawus, one of the students of Ibn Abbas. This is the authentic practice for both men and women. Pardon? Uh, the hadith which is uh, narrated of placing the right hand and the left below the navel, navel, this is attributed to Ali radiallahu anhu. It's attributed to him. But because there are breaks in the chain, there is the individual in it, Abdul Rahman is, uh, is weak, known to have been a liar. That attribution to Ali is a false attribution. So it's not blaming Ali, it's not to say Ali narrated something weak. No, it was that individual who attributed to Ali who was in fact uh, uh, making a false narration. So that hadith, which is the main hadith on which the Hanafi school builds the practice for men to place the right hand on the left hand under the navel, this practice then becomes an invalid practice according to Islamic law because of the fact that it is not supported by authentic evidence. And the only authentic hadith on the subject is one narrated by Tawus, right, the Tabi'i, one of the leading scholars, students amongst the Sahaba, of the Sahaba, who narrated from Ibn Abbas that the correct position of the hand in Salah is the right hand on the left hand on the chest. Right? Now, how the right hand on the left hand, since there are various narrations describing it, whether it was right hand over hand, right hand over wrist, right hand over forearm, these are all related narrations. Whether the hand is placed or whether it is held, I mean, these are all variations the Prophet did. But the place in terms of positioning on the body is correctly on the chest. And of course, the chest doesn't necessarily mean, as some people have taken it to mean, that they're going to put it up here, you see? You know, they feel that this is placing it on the chest. Well, yes, it is on the chest, but I mean, if that's how you feel comfortable in praying, then no harm. But to insist that this is the way, no. Because the chest is that region which starts from where your stomach ends, you know, where the rib cage, everything above that whole region there is considered to be chest. So wherever you put it there, you know, it's fine. Now, you find the Malikis, for example, in the Sudan, they may place it over, there's, there's, there's some place, of course, hands at the side, that is definitely no hadith side to substantiate that at all. But those who place right and left in prayer, you'll find many of them, they will do it this way, right? And you ask them, why are you doing it this way? They say, well, you know, it's covering the heart, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is the uh, rationale behind it, you know? You know, and people, when they greet and they shake hands, you know, salam alaikum, and then they touch it on the heart, right? They say, I'm taking that salam to the heart. <laughs> so these practices, of course, we don't have any authentic narrations to support this practice. You know? uh, I mean, if you as an individual, you know, did it on an occasion, that's one thing, right? But once it becomes a practice, a standard, then we have involved ourselves now in innovation, right? <laughs> Okay, brother's question is concerning Abu Hanifa himself and how he could possibly have conveyed this uh, misinformation. He would have uh, misunderstood it. I mean, he would have been conveying wrong information. Well, Abu Hanifa <coughs> uh, was not a known muhaddith. Right? In fact, uh, when you look at the setting up of the madhab or his mode of teaching, he relied to a large degree on qiyas, you know, over hadith narrations because of the fact that in Iraq the majority of the fabrication of hadith began there. So he was wary about the use of hadith. And many of the narrations available in Iraq were themselves week. But anyway, because we have a practice in the school, in the madhab, it doesn't necessarily mean that this was the position of Abu Hanifa himself. Because uh, 
as uh, Abu Yusuf and Muhammad al-Shaybani pointed out to his main two students, that they varied with Abu Hanifa in more than 50% of his rulings. And their rulings have become the rulings of the Matab also. So, well, and, and as scholars down through the centuries uh, took positions, these things became added to the to the madhab over the over the years, over the centuries. So, when we speak about a madhab and a position in a madhab, it doesn't necessarily mean that the leading scholar of that madhab held all those positions. It could just be the common or most uh, popular practice amongst the followers of that particular madhab in our times or in recent times. Anyway, the point is that with regards to a hadith which is considered to be maudur or life, we cannot use it for a point of Islamic law. We cannot narrate it, especially if it's, if it's maudur, we cannot narrate it saying it is from Rasulullah because if we do so, then we fall under another heading where Prophet ﷺ stated مَنْ كَذَّبَ عَلَيَّ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَلْيَتَبَوَّعْ مِنْ قَعْدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ Whoever uh, lies about me deliberately will find his seating place in the hellfire. This is a severe warning which the Prophet ﷺ repeated under a number of occasions and as a result of which when we talked about those who narrated from Prophet ﷺ the total number of companions who narrated from Prophet ﷺ we <coughs> Uh, pointed out that their numbers were quite small, 1,060 or so, in relationship to the tens of thousands that actually were with him in the last pilgrimage, who were, you know, as his companions, a very small portion amongst them. They were well aware of this, these hadiths, these warnings, so they were very fearful not to narrate anything that might. Uh, inadvertently or mistakenly be attributed to Prophet Muhammad around me. Okay, uh, <clears throat> what time was it that you said you wanted to bring? <laughs> <laughs> oh, was it? That was that. 845. Well, uh, we can stop at this point here. It's a natural point of uh, pause. And as I said, we'll save our questions for the end of the second session, inshallah. Subhanakallah wa bihamdika. Ashadu wa la ilaha ila ant. Astaghfiruka wa natubu alayka. Assalamu wa salam wa rasulillah. All praise is due to Allah. And may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. In the previous session, <clears throat> we completed looking at the rejected narrations or rejected reports, khabar al mardud or the da'if hadiths. Except that at the very end of it, when we're talking about uh, fabrication, the uh, fabricated hadith and how such hadith can never be elevated we also needed to look at <clears throat> the reason or the ways by which these uh, fabrications may be identified the one which I spoke about most commonly was that of a liar being in the chain so how does one know that such and such a person is a liar One may know so either by the confession of the individual himself, and there are cases of certain individuals, a well known one is Abu Isma, Nuh ibn Abi Maryam, who confessed to fabricating hadiths about the various chapters of the Quran and attributing them to Ibn Abbas. You know, when he was questioned about this, he said that 
you know, he found that people were getting so much involved in, in fiqh that they were neglecting the Quran. So he fabricated these hadiths about the various chapters of the Quran to encourage people to uh, read the Quran more regularly. Right? He admitted it on his deathbed. The second way is where we have an indirect, that's a direct confession. The other, second way is we, where we have an indirect confession when a person is asked about his date of birth and he gives a date of birth which is after the death of his teacher or the person he's supposed to be narrating from. He didn't meet this person. So it means that he is lying. He lied. Is considered to be an indirect confession. Uh, the second method, first method was a direct confession, where a person on his deathbed or whatever, trying to clear the um, record before he passes from this world, you know, you had people, a number of people who did that. They admitted fabricating hadith. And among them, of course, is Surah Yasin. You know, all of the hadiths which talk about the virtues of reading Surah Yasin, they are all fabricated. Every last one of them. Yasin is the most popular chapter, you know, of the Quran, Surah in the Quran for the mass of people. And you have all kinds of hadith. One that would say, for example, everything has a heart. And the heart of the Quran is Yasin. Fabricated. And it says, read, read Yasin to your dead. And people who are dead, right? People who are dead and dying, read Yasin to them. You know, it will ease the passage into the next life, fabricated, so on and so forth. All the rewards that are mentioned about reading Yasin, there is nothing authentic on Surah Yasin. Okay, either it is weak or it is fabricated. <coughs> the third way is what we, they refer to as circumstantial factors about the narrator uh, which indicate that the individual uh, is a liar in that he, for example, may be a Shiite and he's narrating information about the descendants of the Prophet Muhammad you know, uh, exaggerated claims about them and it's exposed or it's come to known that he was amongst the Shiites. So these are among the signs which indirectly point to a liar. And there may be circumstantial factors in the hadith itself wherein the text which is being narrated has in it grammatical errors. Inconceivable, and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu you know, made these statements because they're grammatically incorrect, right? Or they contain information which contradicts uh, the basic senses. You know what our senses tell us quite obviously, and this information contradicts the basic what the basic senses tell us. And thirdly, where it contradicts the obvious meanings of the Quran, these are among the signs of fabrication and hadith. Now, when we look at the reasons for fabrication, they have been put in four main reasons. The first one is referred to as false piety false piety this was the case of uh, those who fabricated hadiths about the quran or or other things about islam which was in order to encourage muslims to do these things right 
you have ideas which are fabricated about uh, different locations, going to different places, you know. Uh, these fabrications uh, were to encourage people, these locations may have special reward or reward attached to them, so they fabricated to further encourage people to come. And uh, these people, uh, when they were questioned as to why they did it, and the Prophet Muhammad had said, Man kathaba alayya muta'ammid, and man kathaba alayya, whoever tells a lie about me, alayya. They said, we weren't lying about him. We were lying for him. Kathabna lahu. We told, told a lie for him. You know, supporting the religion, not lying about him. But of course, this was a, a major error, you know. Uh, we don't have any justification for this. No matter how uh, good our intentions may be, this is actually promoting the idea that the means, the, the ends justify the means, right? And in, for example, that well-known book, Tabligh in Isab, you will find in it many uh, fabricated narrations. Many. But people have argued that, you know, they're encouraging people to do Fadail al-A'mal, Fadail al-A'mal, right? And there is a point which concerns weak hadith, where some of the scholars did differ Right? Uh, Imam Ahmed, for example, he preferred using a weak hadith over using qiyas. If he had to choose between using qiyas, that is deduction by analogy, and we'll go into that in our next session, a month and a half to two months from now when we do the course on usul al-fiqh, and that is the next course, level six. Uh, this uh, principle of qiyas, where we deduce rulings based on earlier rulings on issues that we don't have information about, we don't have a ruling on, but we have issues which there is already a ruling on and they share in some characteristics, so we take a ruling from the past and apply it on something in the present. We call this qiyas, right? Now, Imam Ahmed, he preferred to use a hadith da'if overusing qiyas. He felt that hadith da'if was superior to qiyas because qiyas was human reasoning whereas hadith da'if had the possibility of being true. Obviously which hadith da'if is he talking about? The mawdu? No, he's not talking about this. You know, which are just totally off the list. Now he's talking about hadith which are daif because one of the narrator's memories was not very strong. So it's classified as daif. Such a hadith, though we generally call it inauthentic, there is a possibility that it is authentic. And if we find supporting narrations, then we know and it's elevated. But if we don't find supporting narrations, we avoid it out of precaution. But there is a possibility that it is in fact sahih. The information is fact correct. That possibility exists. So Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal preferred to use something with that possibility than to rely purely on human reasoning. To rely purely on human reasoning. Other scholars, they did permit the use.